they, they, they're thankful. You know, they, they show uh, kindness. They, they like the kindness and they pass the kindness along. What goes around comes around, I like to think. If you're kind to people, people are going to be kind to you. If you're mean to people, people are going to be mean to you. God will see to it, I promise you. But some people, if you do something nice for them, you get a complete different reaction. Rather than being thankful, they wonder, well, I wonder what took them so long to get around to helping me. Or I wonder why they didn't help me more. You know, that's the attitude that some people have. And let me ask you, you know, if, if you do something nice for two people and, and one of them is grateful and the other one is ungrateful, just kind of throws it or ignores you, acts like, you know, throws it back in your face. When it comes around next time, which one are you liable to be helpful to? The one that was thankful, of course, and it's the same way with our Heavenly Father. If, you know, if, if, if Father does something nice for you and he does something nice for another one of his children and you're ungrateful and the other person is grateful, which one is God going to help be more willing to help next time? Of course, the one is grateful. He has feelings. You know, we have emotions and feelings just like he does. I mean, we're created in his image. So let's open our Bibles. We're going to see that gratitude grows. It really does. And I want you to hang on to that throughout this message today. We're going to begin in 1 Samuel chapter 11. You can be opening your Bibles there. But gratitude grows. And the world is a better place when people are kind to each other. And that's our lesson today. 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. Now let me set this up for you. Saul has, has been chosen by God to be the first man king of Israel. Israel, you know, God wanted to be their king. But no, they said... We need a man king. We, we want a man king like the other nations of the world have. So God gave in. Samuel presented their petition to God and God chose Saul. In fact, is, let me pick up the last verse of chapter 10. But the children of Belial, these are worthless or lawless, said, How shall this man save us? Referring to Saul. How is Saul going to save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. He was a little humble. And others, I think, were envious of him. Why, why did God choose Saul to be the king? And uh, members of other tribes, they didn't bring gifts to him, but he just kind of let it slide. Well, what happened? Chapter 11, verse 1. Then Nahash, Nahash means snake or serpent. And this Nahash was mean as a snake. Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve thee. Now, this Jabesh Gilead is, Gilead is on the east side of Jordan. And, and it wasn't all that long ago that uh, Judges chapter 21 will bear this out. It wasn't all that long ago that all the males of Jabesh Gilead were killed because they wouldn't go up to war against the Benjamites. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, On this condition will I make a covenant with you that I may thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. Sound like a nice guy, you know? We want to serve you, Nahash. Well, on this condition, you let me pluck out every one of you's right eye. Then you can serve me. Ooh, he's nasty, folks. And you know what? He's, he's probably got a reason to be a little bit nasty because you remember a judge that was named Jephthah? He put a thumping on the Ammonites. Why? They deserved it. They came up to, to, to Israel and said, you stole our land. We want our land back. And Jephthah said, no, no, let me correct you. Here's what happened. And he gave him a real good history lesson. It wasn't uh, Israel who took the Ammonites' land. Israel took 
the Amorites land. But it had been taken from the Moabites some 300 years before. Now all of a sudden the king of Ammon shows up and he's claiming that land. And Jephthah said, what, where have you been for 300 years if you were going to claim that land? It's, you know, you keep the land that Chemosh, your God, gives you. We're going to keep the land that Yahweh gives us. Verse 3. And the elders of Jabez said unto him, Give us seven days respite. Let, let us think about this for seven days. That we may send messengers unto all the coast or the borders of Israel. And then, if there be no man to save us, we will come out to thee. We'll surrender and let you pluck out our right eye. Either Nahash, and I kind of wonder why Nahash was okay with this. Either possibly he wasn't ready to, to do what he was wanting to do, or he thought that there was no one that would come to their aid. Verse 4. Then came the messengers to Gibeah of Saul. This is Saul's hometown. And told the tidings in the ears of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. No, not, they didn't need weeping here. They needed action. And, and that's what Saul is going to provide. And behold, Saul came after the herd out of the field. This kind of shows a little bit of humility on Saul's part, I think. He's already been told he's going to be the king. What does he do? He goes home, gets the oxen, hooks up the plows, and he goes to work. So, pretty humble, actually. And Saul said, What aileth the people that they weep? And they told him the tidings of the men of Jabesh. Verse 6, And the Spirit of God, that's the Holy Spirit, came upon Saul when he heard those tidings. And his anger was kindled greatly. He got his righteous indignation up, which is not a bad thing to do. Verse 7. And he took a yoke of oxen and hewed them in pieces. He cut the oxen up in pieces and sent them throughout all the coast, all the borders of Israel, by the hands of messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done unto his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. In other words, as they were thinking as one man. This fear of Saul actually inspired by our Heavenly Father, I believe. Verse 8, And when he numbered them in Bezek... The children of Israel were 300,000, and the men of Judah, 30,000. Total of 330,000. That's a, a good-sized army. And we can kind of discern a trace of things to come here. What do you notice about those numbers? They're divided. He didn't say he had an army of 330,000. He said Israel had 300,000. Judah had 30,000 kind of a sign of things to come. You know, that stick was going to be broken and there were going to be two sticks. And there will be two sticks until they're rejoined as we learn in Ezekiel chapter 37. And they said unto the messengers that came, Thus shall ye say unto the men of Jabesh Gilead, Tomorrow, by the time the sun be hot, this was a figure of speech meaning about noon. This is a quick response on their part. Ye shall have help. And this word can be translated deliverance. And they're going to deliver him from Nahash the snake. And the messengers came and showed it to the men of Jabesh, and they were glad. <laughs> they saved their bacon, you know. Uh, they, if they had surrendered, what was going to happen to all of them? He was going to pluck out their right eye. Verse 11, And it was so on the mor morrow that Saul put the people in three companies, and they came into the midst of the host in the morning watch. This would be between 3 and 6 a.m. And slew the Ammonites until the heat of the day, and it came to pass that they which remained were scattered so that the two of them were not left together. There was no possibility of regrouping. 
Now, this was a brilliant strategy, actually. Uh, what did they keep the element of? They kept the element of surprise. The Ammonites thought they had until the heat of the day. But here they showed up at 3 to 6 in the morning, and by the heat of the day, they had already caused them to scatter all over the place. So uh, that was a brilliant strategy on their part. And the people said unto Samuel, Who is he that said, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring them in, that we may put them to death. Who was it that said back in chapter 10, the last verse, Shall Saul save us? He sure did. He proved it. Bring those men of Belial and let's kill them. And Saul said, There shall not a man be put to death this day. For today the Lord, Yahweh, hath wrought salvation in Israel. Saul giving credit where credit is due. And you know, all the years that Saul was influenced by Samuel, he did a pretty good job. He was a pretty good king, all in all. But boy, when Samuel passed away and he started going the wrong direction, moving away from God, uh, things started going bad in a hurry. Then said Samuel to the people, Come and let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. Now Gilgal was the first place of encampment after Israel crossed the Jordan. You remember the, the Jordan dried up where they could walk across. What did the priests do? They, they instructed them, you pick up one man of each tribe, pick up a stone out of the Jordan, the, the, the riverbed, and they created a memorial on the other side. That was at Gilgal is where this is talking about. Renew the kingdom there. And all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. And there they sacrificed sacrifices of peace offerings or thank offerings before the Lord. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly, celebrating the victory over the Ammonites. Now let me ask you, if somebody named the snake came up to you and was threatening to take over your town and you realized you didn't have enough army to fight against him, so you said... Well, I'll tell you what, we'll give in and we'll just surrender to you and we'll serve you. And then if the snake said, on this condition, will I let you surrender and serve me, that I pluck your right eyes out. And then someone came along and delivered you from that threat. Would you be grateful? Absolutely. The men of Jabesh Gilead, the people of Jabesh Gilead, I shouldn't make it gender specific, they would not soon forget the kindness that Saul showed to them by delivering them from Nahash the snake. Turn with me to the last chapter of this same book, chapter 31. Again, all the days of Samuel, Saul did good. But when Samuel passed away, things started going bad for Israel. And we find them in, in desperate straits. This chapter covers the death of of Saul. But what I want you to, to get out of this is what the people of Jabesh Gilead did to show appreciation, uh, to show gratitude to Saul. Chapter 31, verse 1. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. When an enemy turned and ran, that's when the other army really started making hay. Uh, they would catch people from behind when they were basically not even defending themselves. They were so busy running and trying to get away and uh, they just cut them down. And whenever that happened, things were not going good. God was not with them at this point in time. And if God be for us, who can stand against us? If God be against us, who can help us? Verse 2. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan, that one who David loved so dearly. And the feeling was mutual. And Abinadab, he's also called Ishui in uh, chapter 14, verse 49. 
and Malkishua, Saul's sons, all uh, no doubt uh, were with Saul up until the very end. And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, or found him in the Hebrew, and he was sore wounded of the archers. Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me, mock me, or insult me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. The first man king took his own life. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. So Saul died, and his three sons, and his armor bearer, and all his men. In Chronicles it reads that all his house, in other words, his family. Abner, uh, his general, was no doubt with him during this time. And Abner was not killed here. Uh, they had another son, Saul did, Ishbosheth, and a grandson, Mephibosheth, who also survived. So it wasn't his whole house that was wiped out but three of his sons and Saul were killed. And when the men of Israel that were on the other side of the valley, and they that were on the other side of Jordan, in other words, on the east side, saw that the men of Israel fled, and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook the cities and fled, and the Philistines came and dwelt in them. That promised land that God gave to Israel, now they are giving it uh, to the Philistines. And it came to pass on the morrow when the Philistines came to strip the slain, come to take the spoils of war, that they found Saul and his three sons fallen in Mount Gilboa. Now there is someone else that found them first. Remember at the beginning of 2 Samuel chapter 1, there was a young man, he's called an Amalekite. He came to David. And he had taken Saul's crown and his armlet. And he thought it would be very pleasing to David for him to tell him, Saul's dead, and I brought these to you. And David said, well, how did Saul and his sons die? Remember, he loved Jonathan like his own brother. And the young man said, well, you know, I happened upon Saul, and he was sore wounded and he asked me to put him out of his misery. And knowing that there was no way that he could recover, I obliged him and I put him out of his misery. <laughs> that did not please David at all. David said, how did you dare take the life of God's anointed? And David instructed his young men to fall upon him and slay him. So these weren't the first to come to uh, Saul and the sons. Verse 9. And they cut off his head, referring to Saul. And they abused him uh, after he was dead. And stripped off his armor and sent it into the land of the Philistines round about to publish it in the house of their idols and among the people as a trophy of war, declaring victory over Israel. And they put his armory, armor, I should say, in the house of Ashtaroth, and they fastened his body to the wall of Beth Shan. Beth Shan, an area that remained Canaanite and therefore was friendly with the Philistines, although it fell geographically in the land of Israel. And when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead, remember these are the ones that Nahash said, surrender and let me pluck out your eyes and then you can serve me. And when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard of that which the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Beth Shan and came to Jabesh and burnt them there, the first record of cremation. And they took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. So Saul showed kindness to the people of Jabesh Gilead. They reciprocated by showing kindness to Saul and his house by what they did. And you know what? What they did, that, that wasn't a piece of cake. The Philistines were 
holding all this up as trophies of war. Do you think if they had seen the people of Jabesh Gilead coming, they would have just said, oh, okay, they're here to get Saul's body and his armor and his head? No, uh, they probably would have. Uh, they did this at, the, at risking their own necks is what I'm trying to say. So they showed kindness towards Saul and his house. And, you know, this is something David would never forget. Turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 2 with me. 2 Samuel chapter 2 verse 1. And it came to pass after this that David inquired of the Lord, always a good thing to do, saying, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said unto him, Go up. And David said, Whither shall I go up? And he, this being our father, said unto Hebron. And that's where David initially would be king over just Judah for seven and a half years. At this point, David's approximately 30 years old, about the same time that Christ began his ministry. Interesting to note. Verse 2. So David went up thither, and his two wives also, Ahinoam and the Jezreelites, and Abigail, Nabal's wife, the Carmelite. Verse 3. And his men that were with him did David bring up, every man with his household, and they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. Verse 4, And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, that the men of Jabesh-Gilead were they that buried Saul. And David sent messengers unto the men of Jabesh-Gilead, and said unto them, Blessed be ye of the Lord that you have showed this kindness unto your Lord, referring to Saul, even unto Saul, and have buried him. And now the Lord show kindness and truth unto you, and I also will requite you this kindness. I'm going to repay this kindness that you showed because ye have done this thing. And David never would forget what the people of Jabesh Gilead did. And on several occasions, he showed favor uh, to that city. You know, some, as I mentioned, are not all that thankful. We've got a bunch of them that are with us today. Turn with me to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. We're going to chapter 3. This is how it's going to be right now, the last days. Chapter 3, 2 Timothy, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous time shall come. Are you ready for trouble? It's coming. We're told right here, it's coming. You better be mentally and spiritually ready. It's going to happen. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Sound like today? Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. And you know, I think, I can't document it, but I believe with all my heart that one-third, the one-third of God's children that followed Satan in the first earth age are here. How, what would be appropriate other than they're here on earth when the Antichrist is here? They failed in the first earth age. God's given them a chance. You failed in the first one, are you going to fail in this one? And that, I think, beloved, is the reason that we see this and you don't believe it, turn on the evening news. We've got an evil, evil, evil society right now. Again, today in the newspapers, we got pictures of gay couples getting married, and they're so proud of it. And I'll tell you, it's perversion, and that's not my opinion. That's what God says. If you're familiar with His Word, you know that his word says that that is perversion. 
And I'm not going to back away from it. Do I hate them? No, I don't hate them. Do I wish that they would study God's word and learn what God thinks about it and possibly change their ways? That's why I teach God's word, is hoping that people will change their ways, including those who choose that lifestyle. Verse 3, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, that means no self-control, fierce, despisers of those that are good. It's open season on Christians. If you teach God's word and try and point out what God thinks about things, uh, be ready. It's coming. They're going to attack you. They're going to despise you. Traitors, heady, high-minded, that means all puffed up ego trip. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. You leave God out of your life for any extended period of time, you're going to suffer the consequences. Don't leave God out of the equation. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such, turn away. In Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13, through the prophet Isaiah, God says, you know, you draw near to me with your mouth, with your lip service, but your heart is far, far from me. And your reverence, your fear of me, your reverence of me is taught by the precept of man. Not God's word, but by the traditions of men. For of this sort are they which creep into houses. They sneak into houses, even the house of God, or supposedly house of God, from the pulpits. And lead captive silly women, and silly men, I'll add, laden with sins. They don't even teach them to repent. Led away with divers' lust. Ever learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And I feel sorry for them, because, you know, as it's written in John chapter 8, Verse 32, what is it that truth will do for you? It sets you free. It sets you free from the worries of this world, the, the perversion in this world. Truth sets you free. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, these were the two Egyptian magicians, you may recall, in the book of Exodus, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate, this means worthless, of no judgment concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs, referring to Janus and Jambres, also was. What, what happened in Exodus chapter 7? Yeah, the magicians were able to make their staffs turn into snakes too. But what happened? Aaron's swallowed them up. God has the victory over the serpents of magicians, all serpents. But thou hast fully known, Paul continues, my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, and patience, persecutions, afflictions, which come unto me at Antioch, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Probably where 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 came from. He'll not allow you to be tempted above what you're able to handle without providing you a way out. Paul didn't have an easy time of it. He was shipwrecked on more than one occasion. They put him in prison and beat him on numerous occasions. So Paul suffered. But did he change? No. Verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax, where they will become worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. We haven't really seen anything yet, I don't think. It's going to get worse and worse. Be prepared. But continue thou in the things that thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, 
which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Have you always known that there's more to God's word than what you were taught? This is kind of where that phrase comes from. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Don't ever forget that. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect or, or mature, truly furnished unto all good works. Our subject today is gratitude, you know. And do you have someone that works for you that does an exceptional job day in and day out? Share your, your thanks to them. Or vice versa. Have you got a boss that, that, that you really feel like he is fair and, and does the right thing? Share that with him. If you're a parent, I think... All too often, parents try to, how do I say, use negative influence or, or, or they, they, they catch the, the children doing something wrong and they correct the child quickly. But when the child does something right, they forget to reinforce that. And that's so important, beloved. You're missing, if, you're, if you're in that category, you're missing a key opportunity to, to, to correct behavior, but also to reinforce good behavior. And that's what we all should do. That's the same with our Heavenly Father. If you, if you ever want to never forget to show gratitude to someone on this Father's Day, I want to go to a psalm that is a psalm of gratitude to our Heavenly Father. One of my favorite psalms. Turn with me, Psalm 116, as we close. If you turn to Psalm 119 like I did, you're a long ways from 116. <laughs> Possibly. In closing, Psalm 116, verse 1. A Psalm of David. I'm sure it's his writing. It's not titled as such, but I believe it's, it's his. I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. And... Uh, more than one time, God heard David. And David didn't have it easy either. You know, and when he was on the lamb on the run from Saul, uh, there were a lot of times that uh, I'm sure he was wondering, <laughs> are you sure you want me to be the king? Verse 2, Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. In Psalm 115, verse 6, it talks about, Idols that have no ears or no eyes. We don't have a God that doesn't hear. We have a God that hears. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. And when you get that way, don't forget this, this psalm, because there's a place you can go and have refuge. And I don't care where you're at. I don't care what the circumstances are. You can go and take refuge in this place, in this rest. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. He's full of compassion. He's not a God of hate. Hellfire and brimstone. I'm afraid too many of our brothers and sisters in Christ hold their congregations in the seats, their pews, with hellfire and brimstone. They don't realize, they don't teach that we have a God of love, merciful. That means that, that, that He shows kindness to us that we really don't deserve sometimes. Unmerited favor. The Lord preserveth the simple. This is a totally different meaning of this word in the old English it means sincere whereas in modern English that means foolish I was brought low and he helped me 
He has a special eye, I think God does, on the oppressed. He has a special eye on his election. You're, you are the apple of his eye, as it's written. Return unto thy rest. Where do you put your rest, I ask? I hope it's in Jesus Christ. O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. Again, wherever you are, whatever the circumstances, that's a rest that you can enter into, a sanctuary. Don't forget it when Antichrist is here. Verse 8, For thou hast delivered my soul from death, who is death, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, he who has power over death, the devil. Mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. Boy, that sounds like pretty good uh, alternatives there. Delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. You know, the choice is yours. Do things his way, he'll do the same thing for you. Don't do things his way, well, there might be some death in your future. There might be some tears in your future. There might be some falling in your future. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living, and he is a God of the living. No one is dead at this point in time. I believed, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. Learn not to trust in men, but trust in God. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? How can I repay God? How can I show my gratitude to God? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. The way to render thanks is to receive His grace and then you receive even more grace. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all His people. I'm not ashamed of my faith, my religion. I'm not going to go hide somewhere to worship God. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. There are five precious things listed in the Old Testament. The word of the Lord, 1 Samuel 3, 1. Redemption, Psalm 49, verse 8. The lips of knowledge, Proverbs 20, 15, and the thoughts of God, Psalm 139, 17. O Lord, truly I am thy servant. I am thy servant, twice for emphasis, and the son of thine handmaid. This means I was born into a relationship as servant to you, Father. Thou hast loosed my bonds. And again, the truth is what looses our bonds from the traditions of men and false teaching. Men are liars. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. That's how you show gratitude to him. You're all familiar with Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. The teaching, I desired God speaking, I desired mercy and not sacrifice and knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. That's what he wants. He wants your love. He wants you to say, thank you, Father, when he does something nice for you. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. No shame in serving him. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem, praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah in the Hebrew language. Praise ye the Lord. So... It's a very basic message. I, I, I will give you that. But you know what? This world would be such a better place if everyone would practice the principles that were taught in God's Word. That when someone does something nice, don't say, well, what took you so long? Or why didn't you do more? Thank that person and thank your Heavenly Father. But then, too, don't forget to do as David did. Pass it along, and, and gratitude grows. Let's go to his throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the written word, Father. Again, it is a pleasure to serve you, Father. 
You do have a group here that seeks to serve you. Father, continue to open our eyes, open our ears to your word. Let, let us be attuned to your will, Father, not our own self-will. We're always careful to give you the praise. We lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world as well. Father, watch over, guide, direct. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the mark of the beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Approximately the same age, but, you know, really, in, in spiritual bodies, think about it, What's the significance of age? Your spiritual body doesn't get old. Uh, it doesn't get sick. Uh, how wonderful will that be? To, and again, though, age, how, how important do you think time is to our Heavenly Father? It's, it's really uh, insignificant. Kathy in Indiana, can you help me with how I would reunite with my Savior since I have strayed away. Well, Hebrews uh, chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, Kathy, make a note. Hebrews 6, uh, begin with verse 4, tells us that once we come to knowledge or have understanding, uh, and, and in other words, that we've accepted Christ as our Savior, and then we fall away, then we should repent. We don't want to re-crucify Christ again. Uh, he didn't fail. We failed as human beings. And, but, and that's the beauty of Christianity. When you fall short, as you say, when, we, when you stray away from the Lord, uh, He wants you to come back to Him. Right? You know, he loves you and that's all you have to do is go to Him in prayer and say, you know, I am really sorry. I messed up big time. And I'm from this point on, I'm going to do my very best not to do that, not let that happen again. Are you going to be perfect from that time on? Nope, in the flesh. Uh, none of us is perfect. We all fall short. But that again is the beauty of uh, Christianity, repentance. What book, uh, this is Jim in North Carolina, what book of the Bible does it say that the Ark of the Covenant went back to heaven? You'll find that in Revelation chapter 11, uh, verse 19. And that gets it said, if you understand that John was the writer of the book of Revelation, who God used to write Revelation, was taken in the Spirit to the Lord's day. You can read about that in Revelation chapter 1, along about verse 10 or 11. That means he was taken uh, to the, the period after this earth age. And where, what did he see? He saw the Ark of the Covenant in heaven. And I believe that God took the Ark at the same time that he took Elijah up because nowhere in the Bible after Elijah was taken up in the whirlwind do you read about the Ark of the Covenant being here on earth. I think God uh, did not intend to live among man again until the eternity when his throne will return as it's written in Revelation chapter 21 here to earth and uh, we don't need to go there he's coming here. Robert in Kansas when we take communion does it matter if we wear shoes and do we have to be dressed a certain way? Well I guess that depends on what church uh, you belong to, Robert. Here at Shepherd's Chapel, we uh, instruct people or welcome, better said, people to 
uh, wear whatever they are comfortable wearing to church, whether it be a communion service or just a regular uh, church service. Carl in Washington is if my question is if you made a promise to the Lord and broke it years later, am I doomed? I know the Lord is very fair and will he or can he forgive me for that sin? Repent, as we said a minute ago, breaking a promise to God is not the unforgivable sin. So turn back to your father, say, I'm going to tell him in prayer, I'm not going to, I'm going to do the best I can not to break any more promises and to keep your commandments. Lori in Arizona, what happens to our pets when they die? I hear you always say how much God loves his animals, but where do they go? Will we ever see our pets again? I know the Bible says we go straight to God, but what about animals? Some are horribly abused and I wish they would eventually know love. Is there anything in the Bible about this? Isaiah uh, chapter 11, you have to understand that's everything is in the spirit, no more flesh, and there are animals there. Linda in Michigan, are we supposed to still be keeping God's seven holy festivals the way they're stated in the Bible except for the animal sacrifices. And the only uh, holy day that we keep, and you can read about the seven feast days of the Lord in Leviticus chapter 23 if you'd like a study on them, but the only holy day that we keep uh, here at Shepherd's Chapel is the Passover. And why? Uh, because Jesus Christ became our Passover, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Fetalina, I believe this is, from California. When Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, they ate the fruit and God provided leaves from the fig tree to cover themselves. The fig tree has fruit. Could it be that the fig that they ate, could that be the fruit? No, uh, Eve got pregnant uh, after she partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You do not become pregnant by eating fruit. And I'll ask you, uh, Fetalina, what did they do with those fig leaves that they found in the garden? Did they uh, m cover their mouth with them and where they ate the fruit? No, they covered their private parts because that was the part of the body that was affected by partaking of the tree of good and knowledge. Second question. The ark landed on Mount Ariat, and it's a high, rugged mountain uh, when the water subsided. How did some of the animals come down? Uh, birds can fly, but elephants, giraffes, hippos, uh, thank you and God bless. Well, you see, after such a long period on the ark, Fetalina, they had to go to the bathroom so bad that there was nothing going to get in their way, especially not a little bit of steep terrain. Patsy from Nevada. My question is, will your program ever be on seven days a week? Well, it is now uh, if you have a C-band satellite. That's the larger dish that was has been around for decades, whereas the smaller dishes uh, provided by satellite providers are, are relatively new on the scene. But uh, our programming goes out 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, from right here in Gravit, Arkansas. And if you have a C-band uh, satellite receiver, you can uh, watch Shepherd's Chapel uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Dennis in Texas, I would greatly appreciate your help concerning Daniel chapter 13, verse 38. Well, let me help you first, Dennis, by letting you know there is not a 13th chapter in the book of Daniel. Uh, the verses you're referring to here are actually uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 38. And then quoting, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things." End of quote. Does this verse 
differentiate between two entities as Hosea 13, 15, uh, through, though he be fruitful among his brethren, an east wind shall come. The wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness, and his spring shall become dry, and his fountain shall be dried up. He shall spoil the treasure of all pleasant vessels. You taught that the second person mentioned in Hosea is the Antichrist. Question, is this also true in the second God, quote, unquote, mentioned after the God of forces? Please help me, I hate to be confused. Well, don't be confused. And Daniel chapter 11 is talking about the Antichrist. Uh, back up one verse from where you were quoting in verse 37, it states that he shall magnify himself above all. That's one of uh, Satan's M.O.'s. He, he wants you and everyone else to worship him. To do so, he has to magnify himself above all, including our Heavenly Father. Todd in Georgia, in the days of Moses, judge, the judgment of God fell upon the Egyptians, not on God's people. Will the same be true when God pours out his judgment upon the world? Well, Todd, I don't know what you would call an entire generation uh, dying in the wilderness other than, a, if you wouldn't call it, a judgment of God. God's wrath, you're talking about the, the vials of his wrath being poured out. God's wrath will be poured out on all who don't love and serve him. Now, that's not to say that all Israel uh, won't be saved as it's written in Revel excuse me, Romans uh, chapter 11. But at that point in time, that doesn't mean uh, that some of that wrath won't be poured out. If you're not loving and serving him, I don't care if you're of Israel or whatever, the wrath is going to be poured out and it is going to uh, correct. John in North Carolina. We ordered the CD, Mark of the Beast. We don't think it was Pastor Murray. I can assure you it was Pastor Arnold Murray teaching the Mark of the Beast, but we listened very carefully to it. He was explaining about the mark and we kept up with him until he said that Cain was a twin brother of Abel. We cannot find in God's word where it says that. Also, he said that Cain was in the ark with Noah. We cannot find this in the Bible either. Pastor Arnold Murray did not say that last phrase that Cain was in the ark with Noah. Uh, he says that the Kenites survived the flood of Noah's time. If you watched our lecture, uh, the last one, we proved that the Kenites survived the flood uh, here in 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55. It, as far as Cain and, and Abel being twins, if you take it back to the Hebrew, that's what you have to do. You can't read the King James Version Bible, have to go back to the original languages. But in chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, you'll learn that if you do take it back to the Hebrew, that, that Eve gave birth to Cain, and then uh, it says again, that word means she continued and gave birth to Abel. Let me ask you something. If a woman gives birth to one child and then she continues in labor, and gives birth to another child, what is the relationship of those two children? They're twins, of course. Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives were the only humans on the ark. Where did he find it? Well, it says uh, those were eight Adamic souls on the ark. Now, let me ask you, how did the races survive the flood? Well, Noah was instructed to take two of every flesh. Let me ask you, the, the people uh, that, that are, are black colored skin, colored skin, were they on the ark? Were the, are they flesh? Of course they are. What about the other races of people? Are they flesh? Yes, and Noah was instructed, take two of every flesh. It's also possible that not the entire world was flooded, therefore it would have been uh, not uh, cr critical that they were on the ark. In other words, they were living in a part of the world that wasn't flooded. Mike in Washington, beside Uriah the Hittite, how many other 
soldiers did David send to their death and where do you find this in the Bible? I don't know of any others recorded in the Bible. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, uh, God sent Nathan, a prophet, uh, to tell David uh, what he thought about what he did to Uriah and it was that he murdered him. But uh, God did forgive David, uh, Mike in Washington. That's who we just had. Uh, he's got another question about, besides King David, who else in the flesh did God forgive in the Bible for murder and rape and where do you find it in the Bible? I don't think you can document that David was a rapist. I just told you where you can document that God looked upon what he did to Uriah the Hittite as murder. And I know of no one else that God forgave of murder. It states in first epistle of John uh, chapter 3, oh, what is it, verse 15 I believe, or 10, 10 or 15, that, that you cannot receive salvation, a murderer cannot receive uh, forgiveness or salvation in the flesh. Uh, they have to go to the Father. And it sounds like, Mike, you may have a little bit of a problem that God forgave David of murder, but uh, I would be real careful about challenging that God did the right thing or the wrong thing. You don't want to go there. I would strongly advise against it. And I am out of time, so we'll stop there. I do want you to know that I love you a great deal because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in depth. You know what? It makes His day when you know the rest of the world is hurrying around here and there, running to do this, running to do that. They don't have time for God. You make time for God, and I want you to know it makes His day. Blessings will follow. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. We uh, hope you've enjoyed the program. If it's helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important, beloved, it's this. You stay in His Word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day. Do you know why? Because Jesus Yeshua, our Messiah, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.